Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 73 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights, where we take a look at some of the wonderful mobs people have been making, and compare them to the wonderful animals that share the world with us and all that. So, uh, yet, uh, this is the first one after update 1.9, and uh, one thing that's really been uh, growing as the amount of birds uh, people have been making a lot of cranes based off the red crown crane so this episode is pretty much just birds and fish so that's very interesting and i'm really excited to get stuck into this one so today we're going to be starting off with another animal from the uh, aquaria pack we're going to be starting off with the atlantic heron or herring have a look at these wonderful guys down here i think you're having a bit of an issue swimming Oh, let's see if we can find the other ones. There's probably at least a couple. There we are. So let's have a look at you while you walk off. Could be one swimming around there somewhere. Oh, they're all up here. So let's just have a look at these guys as they go. So this is the Atlantic Heron, also known as uh, Culipa Handigurus, which is a herring from the family Cupilidae which is a group of bony fish. Um, they are considered one of the most abundant fish species in the world and uh, can be found on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. So found basically the eastern side of the US, up into Europe and even up to the lower reaches of the um, Arctic Circle, though they're not really considered an Antarctic, spe uh, not Antarctic, Arctic species. So these are really cool little fishes here. They're also um, get quite big. They can get up to about 45 centimeters long. Or about 18 inches in length and they weigh about a kilogram or 2.4 pounds and their diet is typically uh things like copepods krill and small fish and um they how they get this is that they actually use their gill rakers which uh, obviously filters water as well they filter that out of the gills so the water goes through the gills and any small food particles so small copepods krill or fish are typically caught within that and then are swallowed down by the fish so it's a really good way of like filtering things like that and in terms of the life cycle these guys reach sexual maturity at about three to five years old and their life expectancy when they're um after they mature is about 12 to 16 years so they can have quite a long time um atlantic heron actually has many different spawning components uh, within a single stock and during different breeding seasons so there's lots of it's very complicated and they spawn in estuaries coastal waters and on off, off bank um, offshore banks and like other fish they fertilize externally so they just release a bunch of eggs and sperm into the water with females releasing between 20,000 and 40,000 eggs which is quite a lot and the males will obviously release that sperm and then they milk uh, and they mix freely in the water and once fertilized, these small eggs, which are about 1.4 millimeters in diameter, they sink to the seabed where they stick to a sticky, uh, they're sticky, so they stick to a surface uh, like gravel or weed, and they mature in one to three weeks. And 14 to 19 degrees water, it can take six to eight days, or a seven and a half uh, degree water, uh, Celsius that is, can take 17 days. And they will only mature if the temperature stays below 19 degrees Celsius. And the hatching larvae are about three to four millimeters long, and they are transparent, uh, except for the eye, which has a little bit of pigmentation, but they're really, really small and white, and then they grow up to these big, wonderful fish. So, um, as I mentioned, these guys are probably one of the most important fish species in the planet. They are also the most populous fish, so they are a dominant converter of things like zooplankton into fish. So they eat copepods, arrowworms, uh, amphipods, uh, krill, uh, things like that. And then in turn, they are food for a lot of the big animals that we know and love, so things like seals, uh, dolphins, whales, orcas, uh, sea lions, tuna, salmon, uh, and people as well. They're very important commercial fish. So that makes them very, very interesting. And they're also very famous for living in large schools. So it's estimates of um, school herrings can occupy up to 4.8 square um, cubic kilometers with fish densities of like one fish per cubic meter. So this can be up to several billion fish in a single um, school. So that's lots and lots and lots of fish. And they're obviously one of the most spectacular schoolers or obligate schoolers um, using older terminology, which they group in... Uh, huge schools of like millions uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of individuals where they traverse the open ocean 
where they kind of hang together. You see all like in those documentaries where they will uh, school together to avoid predators. Those are mainly herring and species like that. And um, they usually use their lateral line to able to pick up where other fish are. And they're able to school together so they can avoid getting eaten, picked off individually by a um, predator such as orca, whale, shark, whatever. Yeah, really, really cool. And also, they're a very uh, important fishery. So um, they're managed by multiple organizations, and it's a really good example of sustainable fisheries, at least in the non Baltic populations. So oftentimes, they are very heavily fished, being the most popular fish, and um, the kind of demand is kind of decreasing a little bit. It's been a little bit uh, from between 1950 and 2010. It's kind of peaked around the 1980s. Uh, so 60s and 70s and then down and then picked up again about the 90s and then it's now it's starting to kind of dip down again but yeah really really important fish for uh, obviously people to eat and not very often kept in aquaria despite their abundance in the ocean but yeah really really cool fish i'm a really big fan of these guys leaf jen and buffs who always do a wonderful job with these aquaria mods so next we're going to move on to another fish this time we've got the koi which is another one done by of course Leaf, Jen, and Buff Sue. I'm really making all the wonderful animals today. So have a look at these wonderful guys here. All the different colors we've got here. So Koi, also known as the um, Nishikoya in uh, Japanese. <laughs> Forgive me for my butchering of that. But um, they are a domestic variety or colored variety of um, carp or a moor carp. So uh, like Siberian carp. And they're kept for decorated purposes around koi ponds and water gardens. And there's lots of different variations of these. But these guys were from a carp, a really large group of fish from Asia and Central Europe. And it's believed that various carp species were domesticated and kind of create this hybrid population of uh, like domestic uh, carp. And um, even some varieties led to the goldfish and things like that, since goldfish technically like a really small carp. And the more carp is kind of this species complex of uh, carp which some will treat a more carp as a separate species to this carp or they say would be domestic version of just the more carp it's kind of taxonomy here being taxonomy but they've also been aquacultured and more carp themselves have been uh, aquacultured as food fish for at least as long as the 5th century bc in china so it seems a lot of them had been selectively bred to make them look nice and pretty with all these different colors here so let's have a look at you Wrong one, we went and look at this one. So, um, yeah, there's lots of different coloration. These guys have uh, obviously they're often spread worldwide as well. They're sold in many uh, pet shops and aquariums. Um, you can find them in clubs and things like that where they're bred for all these different colors and they can even sell for really, really high numbers. Even um, a Chinese collector actually bought a ko uh, koi carp for like two million dollars, which is really really interesting and they have all sorts of different breeds and things there's also different varieties some with like white skin different markings um the kokahu i believe that's what this one is all sorts of different colors and varieties that you can get some are more rare and expensive than others but the main difference of between these guys and goldfish is that goldfish were actually developed uh, in china more than a thousand years ago by selective breeding while carp have kind of been uh, bred in japan and stuff like that between the first half of the 19th century where these guys were kind of selectively called for their color so these guys are kind of like rushly domesticated comparatively and these guys are really hardy fish so they can live in cold water but they like living in water between 15 to 25 degrees celsius or 59 to 77 degrees fahrenheit and they do not react uh well to long cold winter temperatures but generally they are pretty hardy compared to most fish so um the bright colors of also um Brings up a disadvantage if you keep them outside because otters, minks, cats, badgers, foxes will eat them. And they need good filtration, stuff like that. But generally they're pretty easy to keep. And they've actually been reported living quite a long time, for like 100 to 200 years. There's one famous uh, carp named Hanuko that was owned by several individuals. And as um, the study of his growth rings of one of the koi scales uh, showed that he was actually 226 years old. So that's really interesting. Though the most accepted age for the species is a little over 50 years. So quite a long-lived fish, potentially. But yeah, really, really cool. Um, in the wild, these guys have been introduced, 
uh, accidentally released in some places in the wild. Um, so places like Australia and New South Wales has become a very problematic invasive species where they could quickly just revert to their natural state of being like a normal lemur carp and they become a very invasive species and it's very very bad especially in places like New Zealand, Australia uh, just places where they're not meant to be and even can out compete native fish but luckily these guys are just a domestic fish and um, as long as you take care of it and don't <laughs> don't release them you should be fine really really wonderful uh, fish here so again done by Jeff Jen Lee from Buffsu I'm a really big fan of that so next we have got ourselves the humphead wrasse so this is another one we're going to have another look at the wonderful guy here let's see if we can get him back and working properly so this is the humphead wrasse with an update really really wonderful fish so um these guys are a large species of wrasse that are found in coral reefs around the indo-pacific region also known as the moldy wrasse the napoleon wrasse or the napoleon fish which is uh, also really cool. And these guys are the largest living member of their group, with males typically being larger than females, and are capable of reading, reaching up to 2 meters uh, long and weigh up to 180 kilograms. But the average length is usually about under a meter, with females really glowing larger than 1 meter. This species can easily be identified by its larger size, but you can see it's got this big hump on its head there, where it gets the name, of course, the uh, humphead wrasse. <laughs> and... Um, in terms of the habitat, these guys are typically found around the east coast of Africa, across the Red Sea, and some parts of the Indian and Pacific Ocean, with juveniles usually found in shallow sandy regions, boring uh, round coral reefs, things like that. So let's just move these guys back so they start swimming. So generally around coral reefs and um, sandy beaches around those areas for juveniles. But as they become adults, they're usually found in uh, deeper areas and more offshore areas as well. I don't know what's the issue with these guys. They seem to be having some issues. But they can be typically found in like lagoons and things like that and uh, more deeper offshore water. And uh, you can also see they've got this really nice bright colors to them like dull, uh, blues and grays. Really does look beautiful. And um, in terms of reproduction, uh, these guys are quite long lived but they have a slow breeding rate. Um, individuals can reach sexual maturity between five and seven years and they've been known to live for about 30 years and these guys are protogenous hermaphrodites with some becoming males as they reach about nine years old and the factors controlling this not yet known and at certain times of the year the adults will move down current into the reef and form local spawning areas or groups where they kind of lay their eggs and these eggs will ultimately settle near like coral reef habitats and things like that and in terms of their ecology, um, they typically feed, they're very opportunistic predators. They'll feed on pretty much anything they can get their mouths around. They'll feed on mollusks, gastropods, crustaceans, fish, annelids, and they'll even follow stingrays and things like that um, and try and steal food off them. Uh, they often crack sea urchins as well by carrying a rock in their mouth and um, trying to break it apart, which is really fun. And they actually sometimes engage with um, roving coral groupers, uh, for cooperative hunting so that's also really cool and these guys are typically found as adults around slopes reefs things like that from waters 300 to 330 feet so a meter to 100 meters deep and they actively select branching hard corals and um, seagrasses as sediment well uh, juveniles tend to be more cryptic and try to hide in dense branching corals seagrasses and things like that so it's a bit of a niche partitioning there but these guys, as I mentioned, I don't think I mentioned this, but these guys are also an endangered species. So the humphead wrasse is listed as endangered by the IUCN due to multiple threats, including intensive species-specific removal for reef fish, um, food fish trade in like Southeast Asia, destructive fishing techniques, including bombs and cyanide, habitat loss and degradation, local consumption, uh, an export market for juveniles for aquariums, which is obviously very bad, um, lack of coordinated consistent national and regional management and adequate knowledge on the species and illegal unreported and unregulated fishing so these are big issues with a lot of animals as well um, these severe overfishing obviously bycatch is another big issue but these guys are actually considered an umbrella species so which means that many other species live with it and they have similar ranges so thus conserving this big like 
big species that is noticeable and people are aware of can help save a lot of smaller species as well and protect them. And But generally, they are considered um, endangered, as I mentioned, and they're protective species in Taiwan, and you can get up to $1.5 million and a jail sentence of about six to five months, or six months to five years, um, if you kill a member of the species, so that's very good. And um, illegal activities is obviously a big thing, especially since the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia are a big exporter of these guys, where they're considered delicacy. They also sell juveniles for the pet trade. And, uh, and the main fact is people don't know about these things like the lack of capacity. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know much about them and the trade and things like that. So really just learning most of that will really help to prevent uh, too many of these guys being taken from our oceans. Still, still a really, really cool fish. Big fan of this wrasse. Also, this was done by Leaf and Buff Sue. Uh, no gen this time. That's kind of a remake. Um, next one we've got is the Black Tip Reef Shark. So another cool little shark for you guys. Really cute little fellows. So these guys are a species of Requiem Shark in the family Carinidae. And you can see they're kind of very easily identified by these black tips to their fins, where they get the name the Black Tip Reef Shark. And also being found on reefs as well is where they also get the name, since the these, these species typically lives in trop tropical coral reefs around the Indian and Pacific Oceans, where they typically live in shallow and shore waters. And um, they've actually been found on reef ledges and they've been known to enter brackish and freshwater um, ecosystems, which is pretty cool. Uh, they also have been known to attain lengths about 1.6 meters. And um, they actually have these like, oval eyes as well. Obviously, there's black tips. Uh, most of them get about two 1.6 meters or 5 foot 2 inches, though there have been some individuals that potentially get even to 2 meters long or 6.6 .6, uh, feet. And the largest uh, weight for these guys is about 13.6 kilograms, or about 30 pounds. So quite long and lean machines, they are. So um, these guys, as I mentioned, they're found across Indo-Pacific. They're found from basically Madagascar to Sri Lanka to Northern Australia and Hawaii. So they're very, very wide range, and they like these shallow areas. And um, alongside the grey tip reef shark and the white tip, uh, grey reef shark and the white tip shark, these are the most common sharks that you guys will see if you're diving around uh, coral reefs and things, where they live in shallow habitats and they form actually quite large social aggregations as well. And for the most part, juvenile and adult sharks are actually not separated by sex. So typically they'll just be big groups of whatever sharks in the local area. And um, these guys uh, fall prey to larger fish when they're smaller, so things like tiger sharks, grey reef sharks, groupers, and things like that. But as adults, they basically have not too many predators and um, in terms of feeding, these guys are quite abundant apex predators. So they pretty much feed on whatever they can find. They feed on small fish. They include mullet groupers, jacks, sturgeon fish, and smelts and wrasses and things like that. And there have actually been uh, some groups of uh, sharks or black tip reef sharks have been observed herding schools of mullet against the shore to feed them, uh, to feed on them easier. So it's a really cool way of showing like that intelligence. And other things they'll eat is including mantis shrimp, uh, regular shrimp, uh, cuttlefish, squid, and octopus. Even be known to eat sea snakes, uh, even seabirds, um, things like that. And even some things that have been found in their stomachs include like turtle grass, algae, rats, stones, pretty much whatever they can get their mouths around. And what's really cool is that... Uh, as with most sharks, these guys don't have any cone cells in their retina, so that limits the ability of colors they're meant to see. But um, the, what really helps is that they have a tatum lucidum, which is a lot of species have, which is basically a membrane at the back of the eye that reflects light, that really allows them to have that um, ability to see in low light conditions. But they also have the ampullae of the Rosini, which is basically like... Um, able to detect like electromagnetic um, pulses by like your muscles so they're able to detect like basically your muscles moving so that's a really cool sense they also have as well and like other sharks of this group they are typically viviparous which means they uh kind of give birth to live young i believe so um they typically like australia places like that is they breed in places like that also, when um, mating for these guys takes place around January, February, or November to March, depending on where they are. 
And what will happen is that the male will obviously come up and use his claspers to mate with the female. And the gestation period for these guys is typically about 10 to 11 months in the Indian Ocean and 7 to 9 months in Northern Australia. And has been some even periods of like 16 months, which has sometimes been um, observed. And they have a single functioning ovary and two functional uh, uteruses. So um, they're able to actually have these pups and they will have a yolk sac. And after two months, the embryo will be about four centimeters long and have well-developed gills. And by the fifth month, they're about 24 centimeters long or about nine inches. And they have uh, reabsorbed its external gills and the placenta is fully formed and some of the yolk remains. And once they are born, they get about 40 to 50 centimeters long or about 16 to 20 inches. Uh, in some places, in some places they get even smaller, about 13 inches or about 33 centimeters, with a small litter size of about 3 to 5, typically. And young black tip reef sharks typically form large groups, uh, where they cover their bodies and they live in salt flats and things like that, even seaweed beds as well, where they uh, grow pretty fast in their first year of life. They have grow average of 23 centimeters or 9 inches per year on their first um, kind of... Uh, years of life the first two years of life they'll do that and um males and females typically reach sexual maturity at about 95 centimeters or 37 inches long or 97 centimeters or 38 inches long respectively of in northern australia in some areas they'll be a bit larger and smaller and um in terms of human interaction they have a timid demeanor and are actually quite um frightened away by swimmers so they're not very likely to attack you but because they are live in habitats where most people will go swimming in like these shallow areas, you're more likely to encounter them, which makes them more dangerous. There have been a total of, since 2009, 11 unprovoked attacks and 21 total attacks, with none of them being fatal on people. And um, it often includes them biting people's feet or things like that. And it's uh, suggested that you kind of avoid putting baits in the water or just try and avoid them in general. And um, they're also quite a threat to spearfishers. Because often, when you spare a fish, there'll obviously be blood in the water and all the excitement. If there's a shark nearby, they'll be like, ooh, food! So it's got to be very dangerous. But um, they're normally caught in some places for, like, uh, shark fin soup and things like that. Also, their liver. Um, but uh, though they remind, remain widespread, it's very possible these guys go it's very susceptible to overfishing. Because they have a low reproductive rate, which means they, as many can be taken out. A lot of that can be very bad because if too many are taken out of the population, they won't be able to recover properly. And they're actually popular popular subjects in public aquariums as well because they look like a shark. They're actually easy to breed and they're not too big. And um, a lot of attractions for uh, divers and things like that. So yeah, again, this one was done by Leaf Chen and Buff Su, another wonderful fish we've got going on here. Now we're going to move on to our birds. So this one was done by... Jen and Leaf, uh, kind of the dream team. A lot more birds going on here. So this is the Rosette Spoonbill. So these guys are a type of wading birds of the Iris and Spoonbill family. Um, the Risconidae, which are found in both North and South America, and are also least concerned. Um, these guys, typically they get about 71 to 88, 86 centimeters or 28 to 34 inches long, with a 120 to 133 centimeter or 40 to 52 inches uh, wingspan with a body mass of 1.2 to 1.8 kilograms, or 2.4, or 2.6 to 4 pounds. So, um, you can also see a lot of the differences there. They're quite pinkish with this long bill here that you get the name of the spoon bill. Uh, this white neck and some yellowish bits around the face and on the side as well. Really, really beautiful, if I do say so myself. And, um... Like the American flamingo, their pink colors is diet derived, so it comes a lot from carotenoids. So they need to eat those uh, to make sure that they maintain that color of the feathers. And unlike herons, they actually fly with their neck outstretched as well. That's, that's another fun little fact about these guys. And they actually sh glide and use um, shallow wave beats, uh, wing beats to fly around. And typically, the species has a very wide range. They typically occur in South America, mostly around the Andes, the Caribbean, Central America, the Gulf of Mexico, and um, also the United States. They can be found in the United States. Um, found a lot in Florida, and in the summer of 2021, there have been sightings in places such as Washington, New Hampshire as well. Those seem to be kind of um, vagrants. 
And um, a large flock was actually spotted in um, Virginia as well, which people are like, oh, what the heck? But they're typically found in these southern areas, so like Florida, Texas, Mexico, places like that. And um, in terms of their behavior, these guys typically like to hang out and feed on shallow or coastal waters, um, even freshwater as well, where they uh, swing their beak from side to side as they steadily walk through the water often in groups, and this allows them to sift through the mud where they feed on crustaceans, insects, frogs, newts, or small fish, things like that. And um, they actually must compete for their food as well from egrets, uh, herons, pelicans, and things like that. Many different species live there. And in terms of breeding, uh, these guys typically nest in shrubs or trees, often mangroves, and they'll lay two to five eggs which are whitest brown in their markings, with immature birds having uh, these kind of white feathered heads. Have a look here. So you have these white feathered heads, as you can see here, and both of their uh, pink plumage is paler, so these guys are quite pale, as you can see. And their bill is like yellowish to pinkish, as you can see here. So these guys are at least concerned. They're a very, very common bird, but um, information about their predation is lacking. So... Um, Nestlings have been seen killed by raccoons, fire ants, bald eagles, and vultures. And in 2022, there was an 18-year-old banded bird discovered, which makes it the oldest living wild individual. So that's a cool little fact about these guys. And just look at these wonderful spoonbills. Uh, Jen and Leaf did a wonderful job with these guys, and I'm glad we're getting more birds. Very big fan. So next, we're going to move on to another... We've got a stork going on. We've got the marabou stork. Very, very gross and ugly looking animal i think we'll use the um first person view i, I think thinking about it but it's kind of hard with the kind of sizes of these animals here it's really easy to look at them like this so this is the marabou stork um these guys are a large species of wading bird in the family um, chocolatey where these guys live in africa they are found south of the sahara in basically wet and arid habitats often near human habitation and land sites and they're often sometimes called the undertaker bird because they have this really interesting shape to them they have this beak and the cloak like black wings and things like that they really look like a guy with a scythe coming to take your life and all that <laughs> so these guys are pretty big birds um larger specimens have been known to reach 152 centimeters tall or basically up to five feet tall and they weigh about nine kilograms they also have a pretty huge wingspan of about 3.7 meters or about 12 feet, um, which is actually ranked uh, as them having the largest wing spread of any living bird, um, which I don't believe is true. Uh, is it true? Um, but even higher measurements have been set of like 4 meters have been reported, but none over 3.20 have been verified. They're often credited with the largest uh, spread of any land bird, so that they rival like the Andean condor. They're typically... Your average con uh, marabou stork will typically be between 225 to 186 to 79 feet across the wing, which is a foot less than the average condor, which uh, is nearly two feet less than your largest albatrosses and pelicans. So typically, these individuals would be very extreme individuals, though things like condors and um, albatrosses and pelicans, they will have on average wider wingspans and generally larger wingspans because uh, big albatross is just huge huge birds and um typical weights for these guys uh is about 4.5 to 8 kilograms or 9 to 7 9.9 to 17.6 uh, pounds though unusually as low as four but typically about like four to eight though some large individuals have been seen to be that size very very big with that bill, they have a very large bill, and they can reach between 26.4 to 35 uh, centimeters, or 10 to 13 inches long. So that's a very big bill for a very big bird. So let's see if you can find the one standing up here. It's really wonderful. So these guys are gregarious, so they live in large groups. They're also a colonial breeder. And in the African dry season, where food is most readily available, is pool shrink. They'll typically build a tree nest with two to three eggs are laid, and they're typically quite ill-tempered, which kind of fits their looks. And they also resemb uh, resemble other storks as they're not very vocal, but they will have a rattling display as they kind of uh, rattle their beaks, which is very interesting. And their throat sack has also been used, that you can see here, to use to make weird sounds and things like that. So let's talk about their breeding. So let's have a look at these cute little babies, <laughs> little goofy fellows. So marabou storks, as I mentioned, breed in colonies starting during the dry season. So the female will usually typically lay two to three eggs in a small nest that's made of lots of sticks. And um, they typically have an incubation period of about 30 days. 
and the young will reach sexual maturity at about four years old. And the lifespan is estimated to be about 43 years in captivity and 25 years in the wild. So they're quite long the birds. And in terms of feeding, these guys are frequent scavengers. And um, they've really adapted for this livelihood. They're basically a stork trying to be a vulture. Um, and they often will be found around vultures. And they have a feathered head. Uh, as you can see, it gets random, often covered in blood. But these guys have a bare head that allows it to easier be cleaned. But these guys will eat uh, carrion, scraps, and feces, but they'll even eat other animals. They even eat other birds, such as uh, nestling pigeons, doves, cormorants, chicks, even flamingos as well. And during the breeding season, adults scale back their carrion and mainly take small live prey. So common prey during this time will mainly be fish, frogs, invertebrates, small mammals, and even eggs, such as crocodile hatchlings and eggs, and that of lizards and snakes. So anything small, they'll typically eat. And though they've been known to eat uh, putrid and even like inedible foods, they sometimes wash down their food with water to remove soil. And um, when feeding on carrion, these guys will often follow vultures, which are better equipped to take it out. So what they'll do is they'll wait for the vultures to uh, vultures to take a meat uh, bit of meat off the ca carcass, and then the stork will kind of bully them out of it because they're much bigger and more dangerous, which is uh, pretty sad but <laughs> interesting. But um. These guys are typically considered least concerned, so they're doing quite well. But threats to these guys, uh, they have few natural uh, enemies and have high annual survival rate. The lions have been known to prey on these guys, and they also have a bunch of parasites. But um, they are generally just doing quite well, and a really beautiful bird, and just really goofy looking. So again, that was done by Jen and Leaf, a really, really wonderful stalk that we guys got going. Really big fan of this guy. So next we've got another stalk. We have got the Saddle... Build stalk also done by Jen and Leaf, so um, another really interesting species here. So these guys are another large wading bird. They're closely related to the marabou stalk, and these guys are a widespread breeder, also living in sub-Saharan Africa. So they can be found from Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and down to South Africa, and also found in Chad and West Africa like that, and are considered endangered in South Africa. So um, these guys are a pretty huge birds. So they get about 145 to 150 centimeters tall, about four foot nine to about five feet tall, with a length of 142 centimeters or four foot eight inches, and a wingspan of about 2.4 to 2.7 meters or seven feet ten to eight feet ten. So quite a big bird. And with heights published like this, uh, they've actually been seen to even in captivity attain heights of about 150 to 180 centimeters or four foot eleven to five foot eleven. Though that's obviously um, reportedly so the males of the species are typically heavier like a lot of uh, birds and animals are uh, they typically get between five and seven kilograms or 11 to 16 pounds with a mean mass of about six kilograms or about 14 pounds and the female usually stays between five and six or 11 to 15 pounds with a mean mass of about 13 pounds or 5.95 kilos and these guys typically overlap in size with the two um, lepitota stalks so like your marabou stalks and things like that and they are um, kind of considered as likely to be the tallest uh, extant species of that family and is actually quite a bit longer and lankier than a lot of other storks, which is pretty interesting. They also have this really, really beautiful plumage, which is a mix of like reds, uh, yellows, whites and blacks. And the both the female typically uh, appear identical when perched, but the female will show much more white in the primaries when they're open. And... Um, Juveniles also are kind of brownish gray as you can kind of see uh, they didn't I don't think they had there yeah, there's a baby here you can see like they're a brownish gray we'll have a look over here a really cute guy but we want to go back to talking about these guys and they get their name is that they have this massive bill that's red with like a black band across it and they have this yellow frontal shield also known as the saddle as where they get the name the saddle birdle stalk and they also have these uh large feet with uh, pink hooks and these will often uh, on the chest is also this red bit, uh, red bit of skin which actually darkens during the breeding season so in terms of behavior they're a silent except for that bill chattering and they fly with their necks outstretched and not like a heron and they actually at night the large heavy bill is kept uh, drooping somewhat below the belly height which is very unusual um, to experience bird watches, it's even recognizable from a distance, so that's good. 
And um, in terms of their habitat, they prefer protected areas with a high extent of open water compared to areas without the stalks. Um, some of these trends are they were maybe biased as coverage of ornithologists kind of going to safe areas such as national parks and swamps because of easy accessibility and comforts and things like that. So um, as these guys as well, these guys breed in forest, water, lands and other floodplains and tropical lowlands. And it uh, builds this large, deep, uh, stick nest in a tree, laying one to five eggs that are white and typically weigh about 146 grams. They do not form breeding colonies, which they usually breed alone and in pairs. The incubation period is about, um, we'll talk about, have a look at the baby while we're talking about them. The incubation period is about 30 to 35 days with another 70 to 100 days until the chick has finally fledged. And the young will often remain in their parents' territory until the next breeding season, so about a year away. And in terms of diet, these guys are pretty generous, so they'll feed on uh, fish, frogs, crabs, but they also feed on water beetles, small mammals, birds, and reptiles. And they are pretty generous in that regard, and they'll feed similar to lots of like, uh, large herons. So another little fact about these guys, these guys um, are represented by a hieroglyph. And um, the description often gives the Jarabu, which is a South America relative as well. But they're actually meant to be the saddleback stork. And it kind of, um, the first depiction of these species is kind of like 3,150 BC. And its depictions are useful because of the decline in the species range in ancient Egypt, likely due to the intensifying urbanization and the arid climate of that area. So it kind of shows that how the fauna has changed around Egypt at the time because of people and the climate changing. That's very, very interesting. And a really, really wonderful um, animal we got here, don't you think? So yeah, that's our Saddleback Stork, uh, also done by Leaf and Jen. And our next one, last one done by Leaf and Jen, we're going through the Americas. We've got the Sand Hill Crane. So another really cool crane we've got going on. So um, these guys are a species of large crane that live in North America and extreme northeastern Siberia. And um, the common name of the species refers to the uh, habitat like that, the Plaque River, which is kind of near the sand hills on the American Great Plants, where they get the name the Sandhill Crane. And um, there's a few different subspecies of these guys. These guys are typically quite common, but um, there are a few that are endangered, such as the Florida um, subspecies of um, the crane, uh, the Sandhill Crane. And you can see here, the color is generally uh, gray overall, with the plumage usually being more worn uh, in the migratory populations and never near um, O'Shea, which is uh, just because they move so much and kind of wear down. The average weight for these larger males are about four and a half kilograms or 10 pounds, while females weigh about four kilograms or eight pounds, with ranging between 2.7 and 6.7 or six to 14 pounds across the subspecies. But um, size will often vary a lot between these different subspecies or isolated populations, with the average height of these birds ranging from 80 to 136 centimeters tall, or about 2 foot 7 to 4 foot 6. And um, their wingspans are typically 2 meters or 78.7 .7 inches. And these guys also give like a, re a really loud trumpeting call, which is kind of suggested like a roll R in the throat which can be heard from a long distance, and they use that call to kind of communicate with each other. And they have typically larger wingspans, so between 5 foot 5 and 7 foot 7, or about 1 foot 65 to 2.30 meters. And they make them very skilled soaring birds, so they are able to fly long distances, especially in these migratory flocks, which can be up to hundreds of specimens. And, um, yeah, as I mentioned, there's different subspecies, and they range a lot because some populations migrate, some don't. A little bit of variation there, and some are endangered. The um, Mississippi Sandhill Crane and the Cuban Sandhill Crane are considered endangered, with the Florida one considered basically uh, endangered as well. So there's lots of support and lots of research into the um, genetics of these guys show that the Lesser and Grand Hill um, Cranes are distinct. And these guys may most likely split about 2.3 to 1.2 million years ago during the early Pleistocene with potentially glaciation being an issue. And it's even arguments that they could be different species, so they'd be the greater sandhill crane and the lesser sandhill crane. But um, it kind of just depends on your taxonomy, because bird taxonomy, just like mammal taxonomy, can be very complicated. But um, in terms of behavior, these guys are fairly social birds. They live in either groups or pairs throughout the year, where some will migrate and some will basically just do their own thing in some sites. 
These guys are mainly herbivorous as well. So they'll eat various types of foods, but they're typically herbivorous. Uh, they'll eat um, cultivated foods like wheat, corn, things like that. Uh, and even seeds and other foods in shallow wetlands and vegetation, things like that. But um, among the more northern populations, uh, they'll eat more like a uh, more varied diet. They'll actually feed on small mammals, invertebrates, insects, things like that. Basically, anything small enough to be worth eating. And they typically, we'll have a look at the babies, they typically raise one brood a year. In non-migratory populations, they typically lay between December and August, but in migratory populations, it's between April and May. So both members of a breeding pair build a nest using different plant materials, things like that, and they nest usually near a bog or a swamp or a marsh, though occasionally on dry land as well. They typically lay between one to three eggs, which are oval and dull brown with reddish markings. And they will both incubate the egg for about 30 days. And the chicks are precocial. That means they're born covered in down with their eyes open and able to leave the nest within a day of hatching. Then they gradually leave their parents as they become more independent after like 9 or 10 months. Though the chick will remain with their parents for 1 to 2 months before the plants lay their next clutch in the following year. So they typically live with their parents for about a year. And um, as a conspicuous ground-dwelling species, there's a lot of risk of predators. So foxes, raccoons, bobcats, lynx will even hunt these guys. Other corvids, uh, well, corvids in general, such as gulls, uh, ravens, uh, crows as well. Hawks, another bad issue. Uh, they will hunt these guys. Even adults may even be preyed upon by owls. And um, prey falcons will even eat, like, juveniles and adults, cranes as well. So they're quite a common prey item, which is... Uh, kind of important for the ecosystem, but probably not good for the individual crane. But yeah, really, really cool guys. So as I mentioned, these guys are doing well. They're considered least concern, but there are areas where they've been extirpated since uh, particularly like in the 1930s. They were basically, from the east of the Mississippi, they were basically uh, kicked out. But the population has recovered a lot, which is estimated to be about 100,000 in 2018, which has been a very big increase with like, some populations being destroyed or hunting by uh, by hunting or habitat change. And the greater Sandhill Crane probably suffered the most, with probably more than a thousand, by 1940, probably fewer than a thousand birds. The population has increased greatly, with um, nearly 100,000, there are still fewer than the less Sandhill Crane, which is about 400,000. So the, there's whatever population you kind of talk about, there are some issues there. Some migratory populations face issues such as competition with snow geese, which has been kind of pushing up since these guys have kind of uh, become more uh, endangered. These guys have kind of taken over a bit more of the ecosystem and they compete a little bit more. Um, translocations has been a really big thing on trying to reintroduce populations, things like that. Uh, Mississippi Sandhill Cranes have pretty much lost most of their range uh, since they used to live across most of the northern Gulf of Mexico and were basically once near basically the same place as the eastern neighbor. But in Mississippi, they've been obviously managing refuges, such as the Mississippi Sandhill Crane National Wildlife Refuge, where it's believed to be uh, 30 then 35 existed and was one of the biggest release programs of cranes on Earth. And 90% of them were released into the wild. So luckily they're doing okay now because of uh, us, such as the White Oak uh, Conservation uh, Facility in Florida as well. So yeah, these guys have really uh, kind of taken off with human help and there's a great conservation success story though there's a lot still happening in that space so that's very cool um kind of the story like the bison the alligator and the whales i think they're a really great conservation story and shows that even though they're doing much better now there's obviously um still we need to do to really help these animals and it's not going to be a one and done fix we need to have permanent changes in place to help these animals thrive so really really cool animals here and a little fun fact, these guys have actually been seen in Europe as vagrants, but the first record of these guys being seen in um, Fairs Isle in Britain in 1981 and Shetland in 1991. There's also been some in eastern China and Taiwan. In 2022, there was actually emergence of a sandhill crane found in the Atlantic coast of Canada. So that's a very interesting little fact about these guys. Uh, very interesting vagrant birds. Big fan of these guys. And now we've got another very endangered species I want to talk about. This is by Didims and Genora Pizza. So we have got the Whooping Crane. So really beautiful animals here. So these guys are the tallest North American bird and also a very endangered crane. Um, they're one of the two crane species native to North America. So like the Sandhill Crane. Um, 
These guys are quite large. They're on average the fifth largest crane in the world, and they're a very endangered species, as I'll get into. They are typically get to about 1.24 to 1.6 meters or 4 foot 1 to 5 foot 3 inches tall and their wingspans are typically 2 to 2.3 meters or 6 foot 7 to 7 7 inches and typical weights for males is about 7 kilograms or 16 pounds with females being about 6.2 pounds uh, to kilograms or 14 pounds on average however the sample uh, cranes that they got so typically like 5 to 6 kilograms on average with males uh, getting up to like eight to nine kilograms, um, but uh, females getting a bit smaller, so there's a little bit of size variation there. The body length is about 102 to 32 centimeters or four foot four inches from the tip of the bell to the end of the tail, and um, they're often you can see they're very long legged and um, very big. Uh, even the great egret is like a foot shorter than these guys. These guys are just enormous, and. Um, sadly very endangered and their calls are very loud and can carol for several kilometers and they have guard calls where they kind of let other animals know of danger or at least other cranes and um yeah all these different calls so at one time before they became very endangered they were typically found all across the midwest of north america and southwards into mexico and by the mid 20th century they were basically only found in canada and um Places, very restricted areas uh, in the, in their summer uh, nesting habitat as well. So, very, very sad story about these guys. But um, there's been some really good cool conservation work going into these guys. Um, these guys, uh, whooping cranes, they typically nest on the ground, usually around like a near marshy area or something like that. So, we'll have a look at the babies while we talk about them. Uh, the female typically lays one to two eggs, usually around April, late April to mid-May, with these blotchy olive-colored eggs reaching about two and a half inches long, or about four inches in length, about 1,600 centimeters, uh, millimeters, I mean. And the typical incubation is about a 29 to 31 days, where they're both the parents will brood the young, although the female is more likely to directly tend to the young. Um, but usually no more than one young bird survives a season, with the parents often feed the young up to about six to eight months after birth, and then they'll often, before the next set, they will um, hang out with their parents for about a year until they breed again. So breeding populations have also been winter around like Mexico, uh, Gulf around Texas, United States, uh, Arkansas, Portland, uh, parts of, as I mentioned, the San Antonio Bay. And there's refuges in such as Oklahoma where the, these guys will stop. So if you obviously want to go see Stanhills, they're very rare, but if you guys want to try and find them... Um, some populations uh, will rest there before, as they migrate. And um, there are also very many potential predators to these guys. So they can be eaten by black bears, cougars, wolves, ravens, golden eagles will attack fledgings as well. And due to the large size, these adults will have few predators. However, they'll be eaten by bobcats and things like that. Though um, the bobcats have actually been a big problem in terms of their mortality since they're so endangered. But um, generally... They're still doing okay in that regard, but that's just natural predation. Also whooping cranes as well. And in terms of the diet, they typically live around small fields of water or things like that where they probe with their bills. They are omnivorous, though um, even the red crown crane may have a more carnivorous diet among the living cranes. These guys are a little bit more carnivorous. These guys will feed on crustaceans, mollusks, fish, reptiles, and aquatic plants. And during even foods include like small birds, rodents, crayfish, berries, uh, snails, clams, pretty much anything they can get their mouths around, these guys will eat. And even things like grain, wheat, barley, and corn, these guys will eat as well. But they don't swallow gizzard stones to digest the grains, so they're not quite as good as digesting um, grains and things like that compared to sandhill cranes. So these guys, uh, as I mentioned, they've been quite endangered. They're believed to be naturally rare before, obviously, this mass decline. But declines due to habitat destruction, things like that, has pretty much led them to be critically endangered. So it's believed that the population, um, even with hunting bans, illegal hunting and stuff like that, the have population went for about 10,000 plus birds from the beginning of a uh, settlement of Europeans to about 1,400 to 1,300 birds by 1870. And by 1938, there was only 15 adults in a single migratory flock plus 13 additional birds living in a non-migratory population in Louisiana. But later they were scattered in the, by the 1940 hurricane that killed half of them, and the species apparently never really pop repopulated the wild after that, uh, after the survivors. 
So lots of really early conservation efforts, especially by like the National Audubon Society, kind of really wanted to save these guys from extinction and kind of created the Whooping Crane uh, Conservation Association, where they would establish and try to use things like breeding programs. And there were first efforts with like a breeding female named Josephine, who was the sole survivor of that Louisiana population I mentioned. She was injured and taken to captivity. And two other birds from the migratory population called Pete and Crip um were kind of taken to the Audubon Zoo in Arkansas and these guys were the first uh, whooping cranes to breed in captivity in 1950 but their chick only lived for four days but um through the decades she actually produced more than 50 eggs before her death in 1965 but only four of those chicks survived but at the same time the wild population was not doing well despite the effort of conservationists and the wild population only gained about 10 birds in the first 25 years of its monitoring since these guys are big and slow breeding it's it was very hard to kind of do that and it was very very worried about the population potentially going extinct but luckily with lots of conservation efforts these guys have kind of pulled through a little bit there's still some intensive conservation efforts where they've been breeding them in captivity and releasing to the wild protected areas as well um really harsh um uh, penalties for hunting them but in the 1976 uh, about 60 birds were found of the like, average loss of about one bird per year but there had been some more efforts to kind of really just bring more awareness and take some in and try and breed them into the wild. And um, meanwhile, the, at the moment, I believe the population as of early 2017, as of 2020, so that's the recent population estimates, there's estimated to be about 700 or so birds living in the wild. Uh, with the remnant original migratory population as well as three reintroduced populations, with about 177 birds held in captivity in 17 institutions around the Canada and United States, which is bringing the total current population of living birds about 800. So very interesting. Um, there have been lots of concerns raised about climate change with the migratory cycle of these guys, but generally they're doing much better due to really help, uh, lots of help from people um, breeding them in captivity and protecting areas where they need and things like that uh, and also lots of reintroductions have taken place uh, since like 1975 lots of history like lots of red birds bred in captivity from rescues released back into the wild so there's a very long and historied uh, conservation story to these guys which is really beautiful and it shows that even after all this time they're still at the precipice of extinction if we don't have these right protections for them but um, really beautiful birds, and I really hope we don't lose them because he's such a beautiful species. I love the whooping cranes. So, um, yeah, really, really cool animal here. So I think this would be a great place to end the video. Thank you, Didums and Genora and Pizza, for making this wonderful crane and allowing me to talk about the conservation story of these guys. So, um, yeah, I think this would be a great place to end the video. So I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye.